uh, and here are the ones with the other one, and so on. So, so this is really a vector space, possibly of uh, uh, some dimension. So it contains all the series solutions expanded at this root of the, uh, of the leading coefficient, and uh, having uh, sharing all the same local exponential part. And here you have the same thing, uh, except at another root, another singularity. Uh, it's also a vector space, and we also have higher dimension. And now I ask you to imagine what what is this uh, what is this edge? Under which circumstances can this edge be a part of a uh, of a combination that is relevant to the algorithm? Now, if there is if there is a hyperexponential solution which uh, corresponds to some path through this diagram which contains this edge, um, then that means this this hyperexponential solution it must live in this. Uh, vector space because if you ex it, yeah because if you expand it like sky one it cannot be there and there because it has this exponential part locally there and also here it must be there because if you expand it at this point it has this exponential part and not this so what that tells us is this edge can only occur in a, in a valid combination if the intersection of these two vector spaces is non-empty right. Oh, where did I lose you? Oh, yeah, yeah. <coughs> uh, okay. So th this is the critical observation. This this uh, this edge can only be part of a solution of a valid combination if the intersection of the corresponding vector spaces is not empty. Okay, and then we can prove that's a lemma, a, a miracle, if you want. If you go through all the R square combinations of two. Uh, uh, singular points, then uh, it's only at most r times non-empty. So uh, we, we don't care about this first, we only combine two of them, uh, so there are r square uh, intersections of vector spaces that we have to calculate, and then we have to ask how many of them, which of them are empty, those we can discard, and which of them are non-empty, those we have to keep, because they potentially belong to a valid tuple. And, well, it turns out that at most R of them can survive, uh, and that means we, we throw away a lot of stuff that afterwards will consume a lot of time when we still have to combine them with other things. So, uh, here we have now vector spaces. This is now the vector space that contains all the local solutions, no, all, all the, if you want, global solutions that have uh, uh, a reasonable exponential part at psi one and a reasonable exponential part at psi two, and uh, uh, there's a, there's a solution which has this there and this there, and there may be several, but not more than r. And then we keep on doing this. So we do it now again. There are r square combinations of these partial uh, tuples with the next exponential parts, and again there can be only r, at most r of them which can survive. So if you keep doing this, then uh, this is much, uh, there's much less work than if you go through all the combinations. Um, the, the, the problem with this is, is it's just that it, it doesn't work. It's easy, to, it's easy to draw a picture and maybe it's convincing, but you can't do this because what, what, I'm, what are we really... So I, I said we have to intersect two vector space, but, but what, what is living in this vector space are uh, things that, that you cannot compare. Uh, so it, uh, here... I have one. So here's an example. So you have some local solutions at uh, at x1 uh, at, at xi is equal to one. So so these are formal uh, series objects, if you like, uh, expanded at x equals one. This also. So you can consider the vector space generated by those two. You can also consider the vector space for of all formal series solutions uh, expanded at x equals two. But there's, there's no meaning to intersecting these two vector spaces because they don't live in a common ambient space. So this is like uh, you, you, this, you can view uh, x minus 1 as, as, uh, as y and x minus 2 as c, so that it's, it's different variables. They have nothing to do with each other. Uh, and this is the point where the, where the second offense happens uh, because now we use uh, complex analysis. <laughs> yeah. So now we really say, I kept on saying throughout the talk to make uh, to make it more uh, more dramatic. 
I kept on saying that we, we view everything formal and algebraic and so so in a formal sense there's no there's no meaning to intersect these vector spaces but now if you think of this as analysis then you can say okay uh, view this formal object as uh, the analytic function uh, complex analytic function which has this series as asymptotic expansion when when z goes when x goes to 1 so you may have something like uh, uh, this is x equals 1, and here this is x equals 2. These are the ones which live there. And then, uh, so these, these, lo these, these local series expansions, you can view them as, uh, as asymptotic expansions of actual functions that live in, in, in sectors. So usually you may expect maybe a ball, but these are essential singularities, but then in that case it's just sectors. So we have here a sector and there a sector, and then you can do uh, analytic continuation of all these funny functions to a common point. So maybe to here. So you, you can write this and this and this and this uh, and, and change the expansion point, maybe to zero. And then you have something that you can compare. So uh, here you have power series in x and here you have also power series in x and then there, there's, a, there's a meaning to saying what the intersection should be. So uh, this is again uh, easy to draw uh, on, on a blackboard, but not so easy to do. So what, what we really need here is an algorithm that has been developed only a few years ago by Joris van der Hoven, um, and, and we are exploiting this. He, so he says, if you give me the initial data in an essential singularity, and you give me an, an other point, x0, and you give me an epsilon, then uh, oh, well, a rational function, then uh, sorry, a rational number. Then he's able to compute uh, an approximation of the value of these analytic functions that are uh, uh, defined here and there to a precision which is guaranteed to be less than epsilon. So even though it's numeric, uh, it, it's still symbolic because it's a guarantee. You have a guaranteed error bound, and this this is not. I mean, you shouldn't think of floating point arithmetic IEEE fixed position, but this is really, uh, if we want this to be 10 to the minus 10,000, then we get this accuracy. And we get it even efficiently. So, and the true, the true value, uh, the true value, uh, the complex number, uh, which is the true value of the function, is guaranteed to be in the form of the output value, uh, uh, so, so of, of this, uh, the ball of radius epsilon around the output value, which is the rational function. Um, and, and that's all I want to say about uh, finding hyper-exponential uh, functions. I want to conclude with, uh, because I know there are people in the room who don't believe in the existence of uh, complex numbers, so I want to conclude with a, a remark of, of Einstein, who, who once had a visitor, who was surprised that he had a, a horseshoe in his uh, in his office. And you know the horseshoes, they are supposed to, to give luck. And the visitor asked Einstein, oh, you're not really believing in this, right? And Einstein said, no, of course I don't believe in it. But they say it works nevertheless. <laughs> but it wasn't Einstein, it was Niels Bohr. Oh, really? OK, I know it for Einstein. OK, I'm, I'm done. Thank you for this awful talk. Any questions? Yeah, yeah. Thank you.